Let's pray. God, may we just be mindful of your presence in this room right now, Father, and seek to please you only, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, (laughs) thank you. I've been praying and thinking about what to share with you guys here today, and um, I'm kind of thrown for a loop, honestly. Uh, You see, I I got my itinerary, and it said I had to wear a suit, and so I just assumed that everyone was going to be in, like, shirts and ties at least, and I had my secretary call and negotiate me out of a jacket, but I... uh, I, I, I don't know, it was weird. I didn't know you guys would all be dressed normally. And so I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, why, why do I have to play dress up? But, uh, but you submit to authority. I thought maybe that's what I had to be an example to you of. Um, but I, I was trying to think back, even as I'm looking at you and during worship, I'm, I'm trying to think back to my Bible college years back to my Bible college days, and I I went to a Christian school. Uh, I went to Masters um, out in California, sorry. Um, Oh, you guys like them? Good, good, good. Um, But I was, you know, chapel feels so similar. It's it's, it's weird, like from 25 years ago um, that I was in chapel there, and, and I'm trying to put myself in your seats. Even right now, I'm like, God, help me. When I look in their eyes, I try to think back and remember, and every year it gets harder and harder to remember, what was it like? What was I thinking during that time? And because the truth is, is I'm, I'm 40, 44 years old right now, and I just absolutely love, love, love my life. Like, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Every year seems to get better for me. I, and lately, the last few weeks, every time I pray to God, it's hard for me not to cry because I'm going, God, I, I just can't believe it. I'm living this dream. This is unbelievable. Are you this good to everyone? I can't believe how close I get to be with you, how much I get to experience you, and it's so good, and, and my whole life has, has in some ways been that way, and yet the truth is, is if I could, I mean, if I died today, I'd go, man, what a crazy ride I've had, amazing life, but if there were five years I could relive and redo, it would be my two years of Bible college and my three years of seminary. Hands down, those were the five worst years of my life, and I wish I could go back and I wish I could redo it. And it's not the school's fault, it's not the seminary's fault, it's it's mine, and I was was trying to think back and I go, man, what made that time so terrible for me? And, And it wasn't like I wasn't having fun, I was having a lot of fun, but honestly I wasn't alive. I was, I was doing a lot of like Christian things, but I wasn't really experiencing God. It wasn't like the, the intimacy I, I, I felt as a, as a kid or as a, as a new believer. And it wasn't the intimacy like I, I feel today in that relationship I have with God. And, and yet I blended in fine and I was even looked at it as, as, as maybe a, a spiritual leader. I don't know, kind of, not really. You, you want to talk college with me? A little bit? Was I respected? A little bit, okay. But, but you know, it was, a, it was just a weird time because I look back and, and, and I know absolutely there was hypocrisy in my life because you learn the lingo and you can fit in with everyone else and then when you're alone with God, you know who you really are, but you just, you just keep going with the flow because it's, it's working for you. And so I know that was the biggest issue, obviously, is the hypocrisy, but I, I tried to think through, okay, what, what else, what was it? That, uh, that I, I, what's the message I want to give to you guys? And all these things come to my mind, all these thoughts, even this morning. But I, I want to dwindle it down to two thoughts, if I can. And, and maybe we'll just get through one. But uh, the first thing I'd say is,
you got to work so hard to live biblically. Man, I'm, I, I'm begging you, work really hard at living biblically. Because the natural thing to do is to just kind of blend into like a culture. And, and I, I'm telling you, get alone with this book. When no one else is around, just you and this book, that to work hard at going, okay, what does that passage really say? And what should my life look like in light of this passage? To really think that through, to really work at that. Because this was the thing that, that, you guys, there's gonna be all sorts of distractions. Man, I really believe God has some things for me to say today, so, so forget about whatever that is. The, what is that? Now, now I'm distracted. Okay, no, what did I just say? Forget about it. Um, it's so easy, it's so easy to get, uh, get caught up and yet, like I remember, I remember in high school, I would read this book and sometimes I'd be like, is anyone else reading the same book I'm reading? Because it seems like if this is true, then our lives should look like this. And why, why then are we okay with how we're living right now as a church? Like this looks really like, not, not just a little different, like a few tweaks we gotta make, but it just seems like there's, there's, it's two different things. But I got caught up in the culture and thought, well, okay, if everyone else is okay with it, I'm just gonna do this. But no, when I was alone, man, I, I would take this book and I would take it so literally. So literally, I mean, I remember, and this is a little embarrassing to me, but I, I remember like the, even the, no, it's not embarrassing. What am I talking about? Okay, I would read the passage about, uh, you know, faith being able to move mountains. And I just, I, I took that literally. I remember going back to my, my room. I still remember being in my bedroom and trying to move stuff. And I, just like a pencil or something, come on, God. I, I, you know, if I can move mountains, I still remember looking at this thing and just staring at it and trying to move it because I'm going, man, I have faith. I go, God, I believe. Okay, I, I want complete honesty. How many have tried to move something based upon that? <laughs> Thank you. See? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. No one else has probably ever given this message, but I am so glad some of you raised your hand. So some of you can relate to me. You look at the Bible and you go, man, I should be able to move stuff. And so you try because you take it literally. Now, later on, I realize, okay, the Spirit's given to us for the common good. You know, the Spirit is for the glory of God. And maybe I still believe there could be a time when God, for his glory, not just so that I would go, oh, look what I did, but for his glory would have me move something. And I still believe that could happen. But that's really cool that some of you raised your hand on that because I would read some of these passages and I would think, wait a second, if, if we really believe in hell, man, shouldn't we be a lot more vocal about what we what we believe and and shouldn't we be talking to a lot more people and if we really believe in Matthew 25 I mean to study it in class and say that Jesus is going to come back one day in all of his glory with all of his angels with him and he's going to come down and he's going to start separating people to the right and to the left and 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 and, and it's to those on his right were the ones who cared for the least of these I go man that's a pretty crazy passage and if that's true, shouldn't I be devoting a lot of my life to caring for those people? Not to the neglect of the gospel. Of course, I understand that. But at the same time, I read some of these things. And go, Man, that's a, that's a big deal. And that's one of, those scariest, it's one of the scariest passages in the Bible to me of him just gathering everyone and dividing them and said, well, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. So you, you, you go over there. And then these go away into eternal punishment? That's huge. Or that passage of Lazarus and the rich man, and, and it's like, gosh, just have him dip it. You know, like that, that's a scary passage to me. And yet again, it's about the poor. I just go, well, my logic tells me I want to pour myself out to them. I want to care about those things because obviously God cares about that stuff. 
And that's what I'm saying, man, work really hard at living biblically because you will always be challenged. I, I don't care where you are, and I, I, you know, I don't know a lot about liberty, but I hear great things about it. It doesn't matter how great of an institution you're a part of, but here in America, you will be challenged constantly to not live biblically and to create some sort of culture that justifies what they want anyways. And I'm saying, man, get alone with this book and do what it says. The fondest memories I have of Bible college were those few moments when I would read scripture or hear a message in a classroom and my heart would get stirred so much. See, because I always knew this stuff. It always bothered me ever since I was in high school. But every once in a while, something gets stirred up so much that I finally said, I don't care if no one else is going to do anything about it. I have to do something. And I remember there were very few moments, sadly, but, but those times when I go, no, we can't just keep studying this. Like, I, I got to go do something. I remember everyone going to the beach and me going, no, I'm not living by faith. There's no faith. There's absolutely no faith in my life. It doesn't take any faith for me to wake up and go to the school cafeteria and eat with my friends. It takes no faith to be sitting in this classroom listening to more Bible and hanging out with people I agree with. It takes no faith to go play intramural volleyball now and then go back to my Christian dorm and then do the cycle over and over and over again. Where's the risk? Man, it, there's, there's a complacency that's going on in my life and just going, man, I just got to go. I got to go. I got to do something. And I remember the way that God would meet me during those times and the things that, that, that I, I would experience where I go, wow, that was God. That was God. That was so cool. That was God. It wasn't just the, the normal thing. And yet, Yet sadly, I, I didn't have the strength to do that often enough. But over time, you know, you, it just starts building in you. And I, my gut is that some of you, you've got this uneasiness, this lack of peace of certain things that are building in you, that you see in Scripture. I'm not talking about just rebellion. I'm just saying, no, I, I see this in the Bible, and it's driving me nuts. I got to do something. Not that you're judging everyone else. You just know how God is communicating to you, and you need to be obedient, even if you don't see anyone else doing it that way. I, I mean, some of you, some of you right now are struggling so hard with your purity. Um, crazy, crazy stuff. Um, some of you are big time addicted to pornography. Uh, and, and so you, you come to chapel, you just feel gross. Um, man, it seems like this, you start your prayer the same way every day. God, I'm so sorry. And I remember that struggle, man. I, I remember that, that struggle at your age and and trying to do everything, like even practically, like discipline myself. I'm going to discipline myself. Okay, if I lust, then I won't eat the whole next day. Just so the whole next day I will remember and go, man, that wasn't worth it. Man, that wasn't worth it. I lost 14 pounds. No, I, I, I remember uh, just like that fight, you know, it was just that struggle, and, and yet it wasn't until later, you know, I'm reading through Galatians, you know, later in life, and, it, and it, it was talking about, man, if you live by the Spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Like, like the answer is not just running constantly, like, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that, but really running towards something, and saying, hey, God, what... If, he, if your Holy Spirit has complete control of this body right now, what would you do with me? Where would you have me go? And, and you just start going, and you're like, man, really? I, I guess I would go out there and start warning people about the judgment that's going to come. I, I, I guess that's what I would do. And as I was going, uh, when you're doing that, and you're fearful, and you're saying, God, come through for me, come through for me, man, you're not thinking about lust right then. Why? Because you're living by faith. You're following the Spirit. You're, you're doing something. You actually need the Holy Spirit to come through for you. Those are the times when you live in purity. It's when we stop that and we don't surrender to the Holy Spirit and go, gosh, I don't really care what you want me to do today. I got a plan. I know what I'm going to do that requires no faith, that's safe. We're not going to experience him. 
You see, the, the times when you really experience the Spirit of God are the times when you're really trying to make disciples. I mean, we, 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 we claim, you know, Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Hey, Jesus said he would be with us always. Man, I feel his presence. But what is that in the context of? As you're going out and making disciples and you're baptizing people, in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and you're teaching them to obey everything that commanded, you know, that he's commanded. He goes, hey, and I'll be with you. Why was the Holy Spirit given in Acts 1.8? You'll receive power for what? To move stuff? No, to be my witnesses. Matthew, no, Luke 12 says, you know, when you're, when you're out there and you're doing this and, the, and these authorities, you're put before authorities and you don't know what to say, he says, don't worry. He says, at that very moment, the Holy Spirit's gonna tell you what to say. So wh when are you gonna experience him? At that moment, when you're put in the situation where it's like, I don't know what to say, Lord. You got me in over my head. He goes, don't worry about it. Right at that moment, that's when you're going to experience the Holy Spirit. See, the problem is sometimes we, tr in, the, in the evangelical church, we try so hard to experience the Holy Spirit when we're in a room like this. And so we'll, we'll worship more and sing more. I'm not saying we can't. I know we can. But that just seems to be the emphasis is, is these, these, these times when we get together and sing and, uh, and someone goes, oh, I think I felt him. Yep, that was him. You know, and it's like, really? Is that, is that the most biblical thing you can think of? Or when you read this Bible, do you think, man, it seems like, man, these people that were outspoken that went out and did their, and tried to make disciples, tried to live for God out there, they would experience the Holy Spirit in some of the craziest times in the context of, being witnesses, in the context of making disciples, in the context of being put in situations that were over their heads. God says, don't worry, my comforter will, will be with you. But like I wrote in my book, it's like, well, most of us don't need a comforter, a comforter because we're so comfortable already. And we just keep making our lives more and more comfortable. And I just didn't see that in scripture. Some of you guys know that I, I, I stepped down from my church a little over a year ago, and I love my church, and I still go back and I preach every couple months, so I'm still, you know, it's still my family. But it just got to a point where I just, I would look at the need out there, and I'd look at how many resources we already had in the church and in the city and go, gosh, I think I need to go out and, and do something more. And also, there's just this stirring in me that, I'm at most peace when I'm living by faith. And for a while there, just again, at church even, it just required no faith. It's like, well, I know people are going to show up, and I know I'm going to preach a passage, and I already checked with other, you know, commentaries, and they, they're in agreement, so let's just do this thing. And, uh, and, and, and it's interesting, kind of the splash it made when I said, gosh, I... My wife and I just feel led to take our family and go somewhere and uh, we believe the Spirit's leading us and then we're, we're gonna try Asia and just pray in every country as a family and say, God, is this it? Is this it? And, and there was just so much pushback, like, man, how could you do that? Or, or that's so weird or that's so radical. And my response is, really? That's radical? I mean, really, so if you're reading through Acts and then you read, and, and I'm in there, and it says, ah, oh, you know, after, you know, Peter and John got out of prison, and ah, oh, and then there was this Chinese guy that went to Asia. <laughs> Would you go, whoa, that guy's amazing. That guy, I want to be like him. Or would you go, why is he even in there? Why do you even mention that? That's not even worth mentioning. And yet in our country, it's like, no way. And I'm just going, no, let's, can, I, see, I want to live a life where I, I can feel a peace about like, wow, I feel like I walked right out of this book. Man, and honestly, when you look at your life, does it, could you fit in this book? And we'll have you know, terms like, oh, I'm an Acts 29 guy. What would an Acts 29 guy look like? What would your life look like? Would, if they wrote about you in here, would it fit? Or would it just be weird? Like, why would you even say anything about that guy or that girl? 
See, that's where the, this is where the restlessness comes. I want to at some point feel like, look like a guy that walked out of the Bible and not a guy that walked out of the Bible belt and go, man, that makes sense. You guys, because a lot of things we do just make sense within the culture we're in. It's not because we were studying this book and going, this, that makes sense to me, according to this book. That's the kind of faith that was in this book. And that's why I'm saying, man, work hard at that. And the second thing, real quickly, that, I, that the Lord put on my heart is just work hard to stay in the world. Work really hard to stay in the world. Before the service, Johnny was telling me about how one of the goals of liberty is to you know, create these professionals that, that are excellent at what they do and get them out in the workplace and be a light out there. And I praise God for that. But that's why I'm saying while you're here even, to work really, really hard at staying in the world because it doesn't make sense. Don't think that, well, if I keep myself in a bubble for six years, then it'll be easy to go out there and be strong. No, it's hard. It's a lot harder to be out there once you leave. Man, it took a while for me to get back in that culture and to realize, wow, they're not really interested in the things that I've been discussing with my seminary buddies for the last few years. And I had to fight really hard to try to just keep a foot in the world. And I'm not talking about compromise. Okay, I'm not talking about, oh, I want to fit in, so I'm going to do what everyone else does. I'm talking about going out and fitting in in the right way, fitting in in the way that, that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 9, where he says, he goes, I made a, even though I'm free from all, I made myself a servant that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became like a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Why? That I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak. That I might win the weak. I became all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Paul says, I got out of my circle. See, what's natural is for us to all gravitate together. It's, I hate conflict. I'd rather just hang out with people who believe like me, think like me, you know, whatever. It's just, it's just comfortable. And Paul says, no, I, 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 I go beyond those barriers. He goes, yeah, you know what? I'm okay with eating meat, but when I'm with these guys, I'm going to go. I'm going to become like them. I'm not going to walk up to a bunch of Jews chewing on a pork chop. Hey, you know, he goes, I'm going to think because he goes, man, I love these guys. So how am I going to win them? And he goes, and it's an uncomfortable world. I get into the world, and then, then I, I do the exact opposite when I'm with those who, who, you know, who aren't under the law. You know? and, and, and he goes, and then when there's weak people, I go, oh, weak. You know, when they're strong, I'll go work out. With, I'll do whatever. I just got to win these people. So I get into their world. And you guys, if there was one one, if I only had time for one, this is what I would have said. I was praying about it on the plane over here, praying about it for the last week. He's going, well, what would I say? And I don't hear a lot of people talk about this. But you guys, so many Christians, or people who call themselves Christians, in our country are so incredibly weird and I, I don't mean weird in a good way, like we stand out as a light into the world. I'm just saying weird socially. <laughs> Extremely weird socially. <laughs> and I, I believe, you know, as I'm praying, oh God, okay, for the sake of the kingdom of God, because I don't, I don't want to just come here and give a message that everyone's happy with or whatever else. I just think for the sake of the kingdom of God and its spread in our nation, what is that message? And the message is that, you know, we, we cluster together and we just start talking about our stuff and it's most comfortable. And we don't really try to get in other people's worlds out there. And then by the time we graduate, like to get back into the world and to have a conversation where someone in the world, see it's different because in the church it's so much easier to make friends because everyone has to show grace and it's like, oh, look at that person, I have to be your friend. So you go to a church, it's easier. 
they have to love you, they have to like you, but to go out in the world and to actually befriend people and to be loved by them and to be connected with them in order to win them. And again, not talking about compromise because that's the problem is we're weird when we're not supposed to be weird and then we fit in when we're supposed to stand out. I'm talking about getting into where people actually like your personality and they find you interesting and you get into their world. And and I hear the excuse all the time from people in the church going, well, the people in my work reject me because I'm a Christian. I go, no, they don't. They reject you because you're weird. (laughs) Seriously. Because I'm a Christian and I don't like hanging out with you. You, You're... You don't, you're not, you're not interesting. You don't talk, you don't even care about my life. You just have this lingo and this self-righteousness about you. And, and yet it's not, it's not manifesting itself in the right ways. Man, you see, I, I, I've been a pastor for all these years and I still remember one of, one of the, one of the, early years I listened to this pastor talk about his Christmas program and and it was great praise God a lot of people came to the Lord and and he talked about how many people you know from his church would work there at the church like 10 15 hours a week and the hundreds of thousands of dollars they spent on this and I and I go man just respectfully I want to ask you had all these people show up to the church building for 10 or 15 hours a week I go, wouldn't have been more effective? Wouldn't they have accomplished a lot more if they spent those 10 or 15 hours a week for three months just hanging out with their neighbors and inviting them over to dinner and just telling them about Jesus? And I still remember his response. He goes, well, of course that would be more effective. He says, but no one's willing to do that. And I still remember my answer. I go, yeah, you're right. That's true. That was my answer back then. My answer now would be yes, but that's stupid. That, that, that's lame. So we'll create a whole different program for people so that they don't have to make disciples and say, oh, you don't want to go talk to your neighbors. You don't have enough social you know, graces to just build a relationship and look another human being in the eye and tell them about the thing that's most important in your life. That's too much for you. Okay, just come to the church, show up. I'll dress you up like a reindeer. Let's practice. Right? We make like this whole other system and we're spending all of this money. Why? Because we won't look at someone in the eye and just be a normal person and go, man, I like hanging out with you and I'm worried about you, man, because I know what God's done in my life and I know this God is real. And I'm just begging you, man, you've known me. You've seen my life and I got to tell you, it's all because of this Jesus. And and because we're not willing to do that, we got to spend all this money, create all of these programs so that we don't really have have to make disciples and yet I look at scripture and I go no we're all supposed to be making these disciples and we got to stop being so socially awkward and just start looking at people I was at okay I'm in San Francisco now and uh, a couple of you are happy about that and and I, I was at the subway uh, the BART station it's everyone's coming out of this Powell Street exit just tons of people and and my buddy who's who, godly man I love him he goes he goes man I just I want to stand here with a sign that says you got any questions about it. not to you know preach hell fire brimstone he goes just any questions and, and he goes what do you think of that if I just kind of stood there with that I go man that's that's cool man I'm glad that the Lord's putting that on your heart and if so go for it I never want to you know stop someone from being led by the spirit so I go go for it go for it go for it I go but you know what bothers me What drives me crazy about that scenario is everyone coming off that subway works with a believer. And yet that supposed Christian has no influence in that person. That that, that Christian would have the greatest opportunity to show the light of Christ, but either he or she's not living a life that's supernatural to where everyone's like drawn to that person, or he's so scared that, that he or she never speaks up, and yet they had the greatest opportunity. But because we won't do this, because we won't look at another person in the eye and just go for it, well then, you know what, we need someone to preach on a street corner, we need someone to create a big Christmas music, and hope that the flyer will get them to the church and save them and it's like no when I look at scripture it was the everyday ordinary person working the ordinary job that was out making disciples and this was their life 
And yet my concern is, man, this, this time you have at the school could be awesome. It could be a great equipping station for you to help you get in the world and know the word a little better. At the same time, for some of you, this could be a complete waste of time, money, energy, and when you leave the school, you'll be less effective for the kingdom than when you came in because you lost touch with the world and so many never get back to engaging into the world and they get safer and safer and safer and become less and less interesting and significant to the world. And I guess my final thought is, gosh, I, there's like 10 more things I want to say. It's driving me crazy. Um, but I know I got, I, I wish I could. so many stories of just crazy things God's doing and I you know I got a flight in a few minutes <laughs> but um I guess the main thing is you know part of my problem I think when I go back to my Bible college days is this let me wind down with this I think I had an expectation of the school that was unfair in other words sometimes we just think well once I sign up for Bible college or seminary okay, I made it in, and then they're going to lead me in this journey in my walk with the Lord. That's not really their responsibility. That's, that's you and God. And that's what I'm realizing now, is you, you really need to take ownership for your own walk with the Lord. And many people in this book read about it. They stood on their own. It was them and God. And they didn't count on an institution doing everything for them. And I'm telling you, sometimes I am not bashing Bible study. I love Bible study. I love Bible study. I study it all the time, okay? But sometimes even Bible studies can be damaging because the Lord is stirring something in your heart when you're alone with him in this book and then comfortable churchgoers come alongside of you and talk you out of it. And that's why I'm saying, man, fight hard for that time alone with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit. Study this book. He gave you his spirit so that you could understand this. Study it and then do something, even if no one else is. The rest of the people, they'll, they'll follow it. All right, just, just real quick. Well, I'll just summarize it. First Samuel, I think it's around 14 to 16. I could just, just read that whole section. I, I love it because it's the story of, of all the Israelites and, and Saul. They're freaked out by the... Uh, I don't know, Philistines, Amalekites, some one of the kites. They, they're just afraid of these kites. And, uh, and everyone's terrified. And, and the, I don't know if you, ever, if you remember the story, but Jonathan looks at his armor bearer and there's just thousands and thousands of, everyone's afraid, they're hiding in caves or whatever. And Jonathan looks at his armor bearer and goes, let's, let's go take them. I think if the Lord puts them in our hands, I know there's 36,000 of them or however many there were and there's two of us but the Lord can do that. I, I moved a pencil last week. Come on, trust me. And he just goes and he just scales this mountain, you know. I mean, you got to read the story. I don't have time for it. It's such a great story because he gets to the top and they're mocking him like, yeah, come on. And he just kills like 20 of them, he and his armor bearer, but it creates this stir and the whole, everything starts shaking and the people, all the people knew God was on his side. So they freak out. They start fighting each other. Then Saul looks on and goes, what's going on there? Who's missing? Someone goes, it's Jonathan. It's Jonathan and his armor. There's the two of them up there. He goes, well, let's go. So suddenly there was this courage of, man, let's go. Something's happening. The Lord's stirring. And then it goes further. And it says when they started chasing the whoever they were away, it says, then the rest of the Israelites hiding in the caves, they started running along with them. And I thought, that's so lame. That last group, right? That just goes, yeah, okay, no, I'm not going with Jonathan. Oh, I still don't know. And oh, they're running now? Okay, yeah, we got you. And I just thought, man, 
I don't want to be that last group that waits till there's a stir of God and goes, okay, now it's obvious we're going to win. Okay, G oh, he's coming, you know, out of the clouds. Yeah, I told you guys. I don't want to. I want to be that Jonathan that goes, look, I'm looking at this thing, and I really believe God could do this through me. And so if it's me and my armor bearer, we're going to go for it. And you know what? Other people will jump on, but they're going to wait till they see a movement of God in you. And then there's another group that'll jump on, but they got to make sure that there's, it's a no loss situation and everyone's going with us. Okay, then I'll come along. And I'm just saying, man, what kind of person you want to be? See, it starts here. It starts right now. Right now, you can start some habits that will absolutely ruin you. And one of those is by clustering together and not being out in the world. It's only going to get more difficult. The longer you stay in that bubble, the harder it is to leave. And what a great opportunity, what a great mission this school has. But it really has to start with you fighting to get out in the world and actually build relationships with people that don't have to show you grace they don't have to like you. They don't have to be your friend. But you do all things so that by any means you might save some of them. I'm going to have someone come up and pray for us.